Jonah's a special book. He can be used for many different reasons, but I want to look at the text tonight with you. And uh, a lot of Christians today are, are not enjoying their walk with the Lord. A lot of Christians today are living worldly lives. They're living lives that are outside the church, and uh, they really don't know why they're unhappy, but it's because they have a change inside, but not a change on the outside that matches up. And I want to think with you on the subject of how to enjoy the Christian life. And uh, the little cute uh, ribbon up there says, just I uh, promise to obey the rules. If, if we want to enjoy something, we have to obey the rules that go along with it. It's kind of like if you want to enjoy driving on the streets of San Antonio, you have to obey the speed limits or else it's not going to be an, a happy time out there. And it's a, it's a great time uh, to be alive and many good things are going on in our country and in our world today. And sadly, though, Worship obligations have become a, a trouble for people, and they prefer to sleep rather than to come to church and worship. They prefer to play rather than come to church and worship. And as we look at the Old Testament, at the book of Jonah, we see there a society of people that, that were that way too, that they wanted to uh, have relationship with God, but they didn't want to live that relationship. They didn't want to honor God in their lives. And then there were societies around the Jonah and his people that just did not even know God. They knew gods. They knew who they worshipped. They said, God will do this for us. God will do that. They blamed God if something went wrong, and they praised God, uh, prayed to God to, to help them whenever they had problems, but they just didn't uh, have a relationship with the true God. And uh, Jonah knew about that relationship with the true God, but he wasn't doing anything about it with other people. He was keeping it to himself because uh, he had uh, political differences, if you please, with the people in the country that were next door to him. And God would take and send him to a different political party to tell them about Jesus. And uh, we still in our day today, going way back to Jonah, hundreds of years before Jesus would come, even in our day today, we see people that, that sit on this side or that side based upon their political parties, uh, that, that lift up this person or lift up that person uh, based on their political views rather than using Christianity, which holds all people equal and a desire to reach all people for Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at uh, the book of Jonah tonight and see what uh, the scriptures bring out in here. The first thing we need to do is admit that we're rebellious. That, In other words, that we don't go along with God about what God says. We want to say the favorite word today. What is that favorite word? No. <laughs> no to God. We want to say no to God. And um, <clears throat> as I think about this, let's turn to Jonah, the first chapter, and uh, the first verse up there. To the words, the words of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. And uh, as we read here in, whoops, I lost my place there. Jonah's not a very long book. Uh, it says, get up. And God's speaking to Jonah and says, get up and go to Amittai. Go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come to me. Now, we, we need to understand a basic concept here that comes out in the book. And the basic concept is that that the city of Nineveh had a different political view than did Jonah's Israel. And uh, that's why we're going to see Jonah just get a cold uh, streak go up his back when God tells him to go there. So no, Jonah got up. He was told by God to go to Nineveh and tell, um, go to Tarshish and uh, go to Nineveh and tell them about God. But instead, he gets up and he goes to Tarshish, which is the exact opposite direction. And he went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare. He went down into the boat and got uh, there and to get away from the Lord's presence. He got as far away from God as he could. God says, go that way. He says, I'm going to go that way. He didn't say where he was because he knew God wasn't going to let him be happy there. He had to get up and go. So he went the exact opposite direction as to what God was saying to him. And then he goes on and he paid the fare and it comes down to verse 4, but the Lord threw a wind, and uh, that wind on the sea, and such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. 
And the sailors were afraid, and each one cried out to his God. And they threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load, because they were going to drown. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest parts of the vessel, and he had stretched out and fallen into a deep sleep. We find many times today in our Christian lives that we have prefer a deep sleep over the serving of the Lord, over doing the will of God, over witnessing, over sharing the gospel, over inviting people to church. We, we serve a God today that calls upon us to be active in telling people about Him and His love for them, and yet we have our own version of what we want to do, and we go against God. It says... The first thing that we need to do is to look at uh, how we're enjoying the Christian life and admit that we have a rebellious attitude toward God's will for our life. The Bible says that God calls upon us to go out and to witness, to invite people to church, to bring them in, and to compel them is the word that's used in Scripture, to compel them to come in. In other words, it's not just to invite them if they say, okay, that's fine, but it's to compel them to come in, to to really make it worth their while to come and to hang in there until they, they do something. Um, Jonah is told he's to go to, uh, to witness to this city, but he doesn't want to, and it's not uh, going to be anything he's going to do, and it results he not only just ignores God, he goes the opposite direction of what God is saying to do. He goes and he gets on a ship to sail away as far away as he can from where Nineveh is. He even leaves his own home and his own people. And uh, we live in a day where people say, I want to do what uh, God wants if I just knew what God wants. And it doesn't take a two-year-old reading the Bible to understand that what God wants us to do is to worship him first and then to invite others to worship him and to introduce them to Jesus Christ who is God, who came from heaven to earth so that we could have a freedom from our sins and not have to suffer eternal punishment uh, because of our sins. Sadly, we usually lie about the fact that we don't know what God wants in our life because we do know what God wants. He expects us and tells us to go ye therefore and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We're to do that. He's very clear on, on what he wants us to do. Uh, judge Woodruff Seal, uh, a U.S. District uh, Court judge a number of years ago, uh, founded a society. That's an a, a organization. Founded a society. It was called the Society of St. Stephen. Now, Stephen in Acts was the first disciple of Jesus Christ to be martyred, to be killed because he would not stop witnessing for Jesus. He would not stop uh, telling people to come to church. He would not stop telling people that Jesus was the Savior. He would not. He, he was going totally against the political opinion of his day, which is God. Anybody can worship God in any way they want to. That was a political opinion then. And by the way, it is a political opinion today that people are free to choose whatever they want, and we don't have to compel them to come in. But the Bible tells us we are to compel them to come in, and we are to tell them until it gets raw that Jesus is the only God and that religion won't do it unless the religion is the worship of Jesus Christ and Him only. Well, he... Uh, founded this society, and it became popular in churches. And this one church in a neighborhood, much like ours, uh, uh, took and invited him to come to their church and to explain the program uh, of the Society of St. Stephen that they were interested in finding out about it. Maybe it was a ministry that they would want to do in their church. So they invited him to come on this night. And on that night, boy, all the church family showed up. He was a big deal. He was coming out and he was going to take and explain it to them. So they set it up and they had the program it was going to be. He'd be introduced and then uh, he would uh, have a chance to speak to them. And then he would uh, take questions from them. This is what it, the whole congregation was told would happen. Uh, he came in that night and, and uh, greeted people and sat down. And they gave this a real nice introduction to him and, 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 and then invited him to, to come and to speak. And he came up. And he grabbed a cup of coffee on the way, and he set down the coffee right here 
on the piano, and he brought some cookies back. I guess he was in a church like ours, and he brought the cookies, and he sat them down on the piano. And uh, he uh, took and looked at them, and he said, there is a, a lady in this community. She lives at uh, the address on this little piece of paper he took out of his pocket. It was all wadded up. He says that her dress is on here. She has four children, and she's really hurting right now. She doesn't have food. She has a lot of needs, and uh, some, something needs to be done to help her. And then he said he named uh, four other families that he said their names and addresses are on this piece of paper too. And he said, uh, somebody needs to take. He said, I understand y'all are interested in the Society of St. Stephen. Somebody needs to take this name and go to see her tomorrow morning before 11.30 a.m. and uh, see what needs she has and meet those needs. And he says, I'm going to leave the piece of paper right here. And he picked up the coffee and drank it, took and ate the cookies while he was standing there. And then he says, I want to thank y'all for inviting me over. And he walked out the door. He says as he left, by the way, if you don't feel the need to go over and help this lady or one of these families on here, don't worry about it. I'll be by there tomorrow afternoon, and I'll take care of the need. Jesus is saying that to us. Jesus is saying to us, I have come I cannot do any more. I have come from heaven. I have paid for your sins. All you have to do is accept the payment for your sins and to begin to live for me. We live in a society today where people live for themselves. They live for their organizations. They live for their political party. They live for their country. They live for their family. But very few Christians today Live for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are more interested in the things that we choose rather than the thing that God chose, and that is He chose our family. He chose our friends that are lost and will die and go to hell, and He chose them over anything else in this world. There are plenty of people interested in all those other things, but Christians that have focused their attention on winning people to Jesus and then discipling them into the church so that they can grow. There are people in our community that need our help. There are widows in our neighborhood that are hurting and need a visit. There are people in our communities that, that just need a smile and an invitation to church. There are people in our communities that would love for us to call them on Saturday and say, I'll be by to pick you up tomorrow morning. Will 10 o'clock be okay? Would 9 o'clock be better for you? There are t tons of people, and the pastor knows all these names and would be happy to give them to you if you just would be willing to take one and to do that. God is calling on us to admit our rebellious attitude about we have more important things to do than the minister in Jesus' name. Although he left heaven and came to earth, lived a perfect life, and then said, I'm going to substitute my life for you, Stat, for you and for your friends and for the people in this community. He gave his life and suffered and died. And then he said, if you'll accept me and believe in me, Mark 16, 16, believe in me and be baptized. In other words, identify with the local church of believers and begin to witness the people. He says, I will remember you when you come to heaven and stand before my Father in heaven and he will say, why should I let you into heaven? And Jesus says, I will stand up for you. Like you stood up for people in your society, I will stand up for you and God will let you into heaven as a result of it. Nineveh was a foreign city. Nineveh was not his race. Nineveh uh, didn't. Jonah didn't want to go to a different race. Jenova was not his political party. He didn't like their political party. He hated their political party. They believed different than he did. And they had different leaders. And God calls on us to lay these things aside and to put him first in our witness to people. And these are the things that we're to focus on, Jesus Christ. 
Rebellion is common. It was common in Jonah's day, and it's common today. It is a gross sin that Christians who have received Jesus Christ do not witness and minister to Christians that need our help and to people that need to know about Jesus. It is a gross sin. It is a sin which we will have to stand before God in heaven and give an account for. Sadly, churches do anything they can to avoid meeting the needs of people, not only inviting them to worship through evangelism and missions and ministry, but caring enough about them to minister, even in a visit and an encouragement phone call to them. So the first thing we have to admit, if we're going to enjoy the Christian life, is we have to admit the rebellion that we have in our lives today. Second, we need to accept God's help. We need to accept God's help. It's not a matter of people understanding. That night as the people gathered, wanted to know about the society meeting, they thought it would be a fun time. They thought it would be a time that they could take and talk about the the society and ask questions, but all they got was a list of names that needed to be ministered to. And they could have come to their pastor and asked about those names, or they could have taken the list that this stranger who came into their congregation that gave them and said, if you don't meet the needs by tomorrow, I will meet them tomorrow afternoon myself. I will take care of them. You want to know about God's work? It's available. All you have to do is ask. Be available. And second, we need to ask for God's help. We need to accept God's help when he gives it to us. You know, we're down here and we're, we're struggling and Jesus Christ is reaching down and he wants so much to help us. As you see in the picture on the screen, it's a picture of Jesus reaching down to help. He wants to reach through your body. He wants people to see Jesus in you. We need to accept God's help. Look at chapter 2. Verse 1 through 10. There's only four chapters in this whole book of Jonah. I hope you'll read them tonight, all of it. But I don't have time to read everything. Jonah prayed to the Lord and uh, his God from the belly of the fish. You know the story that Jonah was at, had gone into the ship and he was down there and, and it came that the ship was sinking. They threw off everything. You know, when you're fixing to die, all of a sudden, all the frailties and, and, uh, of your life and all the different uh, money and all the different possessions and all the different relationships you have become trivial. The only thing that's important then is your life. And these sailors were drowning, and they knew the ship was going down and they were going to die. And they prayed to their gods, but there aren't any other gods. There's only one God. And they prayed to their gods, but nothing happened. And they thought, well, we've got old Jonah down. He he is an Israelite. He has a different God than us. Let's find out if it's his God that's mad and causing this ship to sink. And our lives are sinking, and we're wondering why. And so they brought Jonah up on the deck, and he says, I have to admit to you, the reason your ship is sinking is because of me. I am rebelling against my God. Your friends are hurting, and they're, they need help, and they're, they're telling you, life is terrible for me, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and God is calling on you to say, what you really need to do is to find Jesus Christ in your life. And if you found him, to begin to worship him and to begin to serve him. And I'm here. God left me on earth after he saved me so that I could be the one to tell you. And God's calling on you. We need to accept God's help and begin to minister in his name. And then it goes on in the scripture. It says, I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me, and I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol. You heard my voice. So the sailors, he told them, he says, what you need to do if you want to save your ship is cast me overboard. I am against my God, and my God is the one that controls the weather. And so they did. They threw him into the sea, and immediately their life was spared. Because of the witness of him telling them that it was his God that was causing these problems, because he was disobedient, they were spared. But Jonah was swallowed up by a fish. When you threw me into the depths of the heart of the sea and all the current came over me, all your breakers and all your billows swept over me. And I said, I have been banished from your sight. As he 
was swallowed by the whale of the great fish. And yet I would look once more towards your holy temple. And the water engulfed me up to the neck. He was, he was swallowed by this great fish that God created for this purpose. And the watery depths overcame me in seaweed. As he was there in the belly of the great fish, the seaweed was wrapped around him and he was choking. And, and he sank to the foundations of the mountain and the earth's gates shut behind him forever. And he raised my life from the pit, Lord my God. God took and spoke to him there and my life was fading away and I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you to your holy temple I prayed finally and said God I'll do what you want me to do those who cherish worthly idols abandon their faithful love when we begin to worship the things in this world, whether it's family, whether it's this, whether it's that, whether it's money, whether it's health, when we begin to worship these things over serving the Lord Jesus Christ, the result is we are like Jonah in the belly of a whale, and we're hurting, and we don't know why. And it says in the Scriptures, but it's for me, I will now sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will now serve you. I will fulfill my vow. When I gave my life to Jesus, I promised to love you and to serve you, Lord. I will complete my vow. Salvation belongs to the Lord, and if I want to get it, I have to go to Him. And then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up on the dry ground. Now, some people say, well, boy, I asked God for help, but look what He did to me. He vomited me up on the shore. Now, is that what you call God taking care of me? Sure is. He wasn't dying anymore. He wasn't in the belly of the well. Jonah was a runaway. He cried out to the Lord, and the Lord heard him and answered him because Jonah had a health problem. You ever had a health problem and said, I can't serve the Lord because of a health problem? Well, Jonah had a health problem. It was called he was living in the belly of a whale, dying with seaweed wrapped around his neck. He had a real health problem. And uh, God wanted to make sure that Jonah knew who was in control. God was. And uh, a well-dressed, nicely dressed woman, in fact, came driving up into a shanty neighborhood, a poor neighborhood, a neighborhood that, that didn't have money and was destitute in many different ways. She drove up in a Rolls Royce. She stopped at this low-income uh, flop house, if you please, and she went into that little hotel, and she inquired about a certain man if he was there at the hotel, and they said, yes, he is. He's in room this six, and she began to walk down there, and everybody was looking at her like, boy, her car's going to get tore up in this neighborhood while she's gone. And then they looked at her and said, she's going to get raped and worse in there. Look at her. She's risking her life to go into this place. What is she thinking? And as she walked down, she came to the door, and instead of knocking, she just opened the door and went into the room. And the man that was laying there was strung out on drugs, and he was in terrible shape. And she looked at him, and she realized the shape that he was in. And it broke her heart as she cried, and she reached down, and she hugged him and held him. You see, this was her husband. This was her husband. They had met years before, and, and uh, he was from a low-income low income community. He was desperate, and, and uh, he... Uh, uh, met her and it, it, he, he liked her and she liked him and he decided that he was going to go to college. She was a college educated person so he went to a, a, a low income a junior college, one that, that didn't have a, a lot of uh, knowledge and, and a lot of uh, to do and didn't grant great degrees from but he went there and he went to the school and, and when he got through they'd been dating these years and, and uh, they had fallen in love. And so he uh, told her he wanted to marry her. And she took her home, took him home to her father who looked at him and thought to himself, what is my daughter doing? She can marry so much better than she's doing. And my dear friend, there are people that, that you look at and you say, I don't want to witness to them. God, give me somebody to witness to like I want. And God's saying, that's who I want you to witness to. That's who I want you to minister to. And uh, we uh, 
we lay aside all of our different earthly uh, things that we treasure and hold so dear and all of a sudden say these things are worthless in connection with my relationship with Jesus Christ and my witness for him. We uh, see uh, this lady hold her husband and she says, oh, if you just understood how much I love you, how much I care about you, and how much I want you back in my life again. Despite her, despite her successes, despite her parents, their, their warning of her that, that this was not a good route to go, she was willing to risk her life, her reputation, and everything else to bring this man back to her, into her home. And uh, he was an addict. She held him. And she wept over him, repeating over and over and over, Ronnie, I've always loved you and I still love you. Won't you believe me? Won't you believe me? How much effort would it take for you to do that to somebody that's lost, to somebody that's not like you, to somebody who's hurting because they've lost their spouse? How much would it take for us to take and to give up the time and the effort and, and to witness for Jesus Christ in somebody's life? How much we need to first admit we're rebellious. Jonah had to admit that. He had to wait until he got in the belly of a whale. And then he accepted God's help and God vomited him up on the shore to him to get going. What do you think Jonah did? Well, look with me at chapter 3, verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10, we begin to see what happened in, in Jonah's life as he Landed on the shore, but the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God will come back if we, if we say that we're ready. That they had turned over from the evil ways. God saw that, uh, it, Jonah as he went to Nineveh and witnessed to these people, these people that, that were totally against uh, Jonah. It to Jonah was totally against these people because they were ungodly people. They were not of his race. They were not of his political persuasion. They, everything was wrong. And yet Jonah went there, and he wasn't happy about it, but he went because he promised God, I'll go. And he witnessed, and he never once uh, prayed, God save him. He just witnessed he just shared. He just ministered in God's name. And then he went away from there. And we see what happened when he did. In chapter 3, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And he says, Get up, go to the city of Nineveh, and preach the message that I tell you. And chapter 3, verse 3, Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now Nineveh was an extremely great city. It took him three days walking there. Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed in 40 days Nineveh will be demolished and then the people of Nineveh they believed God they proclaimed a fast they dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least and when the word reached the king of Nineveh he got up from his throne he took off his royal robe he put on sackcloth he sat in ashes and then he issued a decree in Nineveh by order of the king and his nobles no person or animal, herd or flock, is to taste anything at all. They can't eat. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both people and animals must be covered with sackcloth, and everyone must call earnestly to God. Each person must turn from his evil ways and his wrongdoing. Who knows? God may turn and relent, and he may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. And then verse 10, so important. God saw their actions, that they had turned from the evil ways, so God relented from the disaster that he had threatened them. And he did not do that action. And then chapter 4 shows that J Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious, and he prayed to the Lord. And he said, Please, Lord, isn't this what I thought while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew you're a gracious God and a compassionate God and slow to anger. I knew this, he said. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord asked, is it right for you to be angry? 
And Jonah left the city, found a place east of it, and he made himself a shelter there and sat down in its shade to see what would happen to the city. And then the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew over Jonah and provided shade for his head to rescue him from the trouble. And Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. He didn't grow the plant. When dawn had come the next day, God appointed a worm that would attack the plant, and the plant withered. And as the sun was raising, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that much, of, uh, so that, much that he was almost fainted, and he wanted to die. He was having such a hard time. And he said, let me die. It's better for me to die than to live. And then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about that plant? Yes, it is right, he said. I'm angry enough to die. So the Lord said, you care about the plant which you did not labor over and you did not grow. And it appeared in a night and perished in a night. But may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which is more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left as well as many animals. What is it that's keeping you from serving the Lord? We need to be active in adding to Jesus' church. We need to be bringing people into the kingdom of God. This is not what Jonah wanted to do, but it's what Jonah, when God let everything fall down around his feet, what will it take for God to get the attention of his church in America today? Do you know, it used to be when I was young, and many of you were young, that America sent more missionaries out than any other place in the world. That's not true today. Today, more missionaries come from places overseas to America to witness than we send missionaries out. There are more, more, more missionaries coming from overseas to America to witness to America to come to Jesus What's wrong? Because America has become self-interested and cares more about ourselves than we do what Jesus Christ calls us to do. You want to enjoy the Christian life? Then respond to Jesus who is our Savior and invite people in. Not only worship Him Himself, but serve Him, ministering to Him. It's not on the piano. But I have the names and addresses of people that need your call, your visit, and I'll be happy to help you with that. Just call me anytime. My phone number is so easy to call. It's on the web. It's on my cards. It's everywhere, and it's used for everything, and you can reach me all day long, every day, and I'll be there to help you when you get ready to serve the Lord, to go and to minister to somebody. Father, I thank you tonight for a message on how to enjoy the Christian life because a lot of people, Father, might be enjoying life, but they're not enjoying the Christian life because we're going against what you want us to do. We don't even know what it is in many instances. So I pray tonight, Lord, that you would speak to us as a congregation, speak to us as a people of God, that we would respond to your call in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.